This is the Digging for Truth podcast, presented by the Associates for Biblical Research, demonstrating the historical reliability of the Bible through archaeological and biblical research. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Merry Christmas. That's obviously not the Christmas story. It's the worst part of the story, actually, that's found in Matthew 2, starting in verse 16. It's a tragedy that happened in this tiny little backwater town of Bethlehem and was ordered by a pretty disliked guy of the day, Herod the Great. Henry Smith got a chance to talk about some of these things related to the Christmas story, both Herod and Bethlehem, with Brian Wendell. He's the pastor of Inland Bible Chapel in Canada and a blogger with the Bible Archaeology Report. Here's Henry. Hey, what are you doing? Well, just sitting around up here. Yeah, doing nothing? Goofing off? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, before Christmas, pastors, <laughs> they had nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. So, uh, you're going to Shiloh. Going to Shiloh. We have pulled the pulled the trigger on that. I'm hoping to book my tickets uh, in the next day or two. Oh, that's and great. then I'll get you the information on that. And, uh, yeah, we're going to do it. I'm happy for you guys. Hey, That's, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, it'll be it'll be a good time. All right, so we'll see each other finally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll uh, connect. I think you said you're there for the first week, are you? The the study week and then the first week? Yeah, I'm there for the pre-dig tour and then the first week of digging. Our, our dig has grown so large. We used to f- piece together different people on the dig to help with the duties, but it's just become... It's just become a monster. This year, we already we already have over forty people signed up. Wow! Which before Christmas is a lot. Like we've never had that before. So, I'm wow. just I'm expecting I'm expecting our biggest group ever. I I can't see how it wouldn't be at this point the way it's going. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So very exciting. Yeah. All right. Now, for those who watch the show regularly, they know that you are the most familiar face, I guess, besides myself. <laughs> and um, so w- welcome back. It's great to uh, great to have you on the show today. OK, so I want to know where uh, we are. We're going to give a hint here. We're in the Christmas theme. So what kind of surprise do you have for us today as far as subject matter goes? Well, we're going to do an archaeological biography, Henry, and we're going to look at the villain of the Christmas story, Herod the Great. Ah, good villain. There's nothing like a good villain in the story. All right. Well, uh, let's jump right in, Brian. uh, Give us some uh, background on uh, Herod. Sure. Well, I mean, it's been said every story needs a good villain, and uh, Herod the Great certainly is portrayed that way in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, Matthew begins chapter 2 of his Gospel by with these words, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And uh, if we understand Herod the Great and we understand the historical context that provides the background to the Christmas account, I think that it's illuminated for us, first of all. And there are details in the Christmas account that are affirmed by the historical knowledge we have of who Herod the Great was. Yeah, as usual, the uh, the biblical accounts put us in history, not into some kind of mythological realm or mythological history or whatever you want to say, but very particular, the way that uh, God has given us the text uh, sort of puts it to the test, as it were, as far as history goes. So I guess, I guess the thing to, to talk about is, you know, uh, someone like Herod, you know, you're kind of dropped in into his reign there. But there's a background that the Bible doesn't tell us about, but we actually know a great deal about. Maybe you could talk about his rise to power. Sure, because, uh, yeah, you're right. We're dropped right into the end of Herod's reign. It was shortly after Jesus was born that he died, and so there was a lot of his reign that uh, that we miss in the biblical story, but we know of from history. 
Well, Herod's father, um, Antipater, was a favorite of Caesar Augustus, and um, he had been appointed procurator of Judea in 47 BC, and one of his first acts, a little nepotism going on, was to appoint his son Herod governor of Galilee. And then Herod was promoted to Tetrarch of Galilee by Mark Antony, and then uh, was named the King of Judea by the Roman Senate. There was just one problem with that. There was already a King of Judea, and um, Herod uh, Antigonus had aligned himself with the Parthians to the east. Herod had aligned himself. His fortunes rose with the Romans to the west, and so there was this great clash in Jerusalem. It was a three-year battle, and uh, Herod finally uh, defeated uh, Antigonus and the Parthians and became the unrivaled king of Judea. And so that's how Herod took the throne. So we're talking about this. These events occurred around the time of between 40 and 37 BC. So, so by the time we get to Jesus, we're talking about uh, a considerable period of time. As you said, it was towards the end of his reign and his life. Okay. So now, as far as his ethnic heritage goes, you know, this is this is an interesting discussion because we, here we have the Jewish people under subjugation. They don't have their own king, like you know, before the. The, the Jerusalem temple was destroyed. So what's the, what's the background of, of Herod as far as his family and his ethnicity and, and all that kind of thing? Yeah, Herod was king of the Jews, but that was a bit problematic because his father was Idumean, and so he would have been considered a half-Jew at the time, and so he is reigning um, over the Jewish people in, in that particular area. And so um, he, was, he did try to... Um, appeased the Jews, uh, even though he ruled, particularly near the end of his reign, he became very cruel. But uh, but early in his reign, he he divorced his first wife Doris and married Mariamne, a Hasmonean princess. And he was he was very careful, for example, on his coins not to put any graven images on them that would offend the people that he was ruling. And that's very interesting because um, later kings, or even a later Herod, started putting graven images on his. Um, on his coins, but generally, the general practice in the ancient world was you put either your your own image or the image of your benefactor, the Caesar, um, who appointed you. That was who you put on your coins. But Herod didn't. He was very careful about that. And so, images on his coins would be like a a cornucopia or an anchor. And and the closest he got was 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 a helmet. Um, was the closest he got uh, to an image that was uh, human like. And so, um, Herod had a bit of a problem because of his um, his ethnicity, but he tried to walk that line um, so that the people of Jerusalem, the people of Judea, the Jewish people would um, would still respect him to some degree, although he was very hated by the end of his life. Yeah, so so he knew how to play the politics of the region. He knew he knew Judaism enough to know that, uh, what, what's the, what's the, uh, it's political expediency, but it's also, you know, stirring up the wrath of the Jewish people by imprinting his image. Now, others didn't care about that. They would, they would do that kind of thing. That's kind of interesting. So he was playing, as it were, between Rome and the people that were under his subjugation, right? Absolutely. He had to stay in the good graces of the people of Rome and the uh, the Caesar in particular. But at the same point, he couldn't have revolts starting in his own realm. And so he had to uh, kind of walk that fine line between uh, appeasing Rome and appeasing the Jewish people who he was ruling. All right. So we want to cover uh, his building projects because that's really important. And maybe you could give us a little intro to uh, his building projects because he was a prolific builder. Yeah, I mean, no discussion of Herod the Great would be complete without talking about his building. He, uh, as you mentioned, was a prolific builder. Um, In fact, that's probably the thing that he is best known for, are for his massive, massive building campaigns all over um, the area of uh, Judea, the area that he reigned, but also in faraway cities too. He would he would also Josephus tells us uh, build in in cities there, and this is one of the things I think that is that is important because it allows us to see a little bit the world in which. Um, the Bible is set, the New Testament times, particularly when Jesus was here on this earth, because we can now still see today um, the 
the buildings that Herod did, or at least remains of the buildings that he did. They have stood for thousands of years. And so by seeing them, we enter a little bit the biblical world. Yeah, it's excellent. All right, well, thanks for that introduction to Herod, Brian. Uh, now, I just wanna mention, since this is a Christmas-themed episode, on our YouTube channel, uh, Digging for Truth, we have a, n- a number of different episodes on the theme of Christmas. We invite you to go there and check out those episodes. Some of them Brian has been on before. All right, Brian, uh, we, we, you kind of introduced the audience to some of Herod's building projects, but that was just a little toe in the water, as it were. Uh, let's continue with that. Sounds good. Well, he was known as Herod the Great for good reason. I mean, he really built some great, great things. He built in all sorts of places. He he built massive structures in Jerusalem, including the temple and his own palace. He uh, built at Samaria, um, Caesarea Maritima, Jericho, Sephora, Peneus, Hebron. He he built all over the place. He built uh, a fortress at Masada, his his fortress palace called the Herodium or the Herodian. He built uh, palaces. He built ports, theaters, stadiums, hippodromes, gymnasiums, water systems, gardens. Um, he he built all sorts of things, many of which we can still see. Um, to this day. And several of the buildings that he constructed figure prominently in other Bible stories. And so um, maybe we'll just highlight two of them that can um, help us understand the setting of where a couple of things happen. Um, We're told in the book of John that Jesus was taken before Pontius Pilate in the palace of the Roman governor which was one and the same as the Praetorium, we're told in the book of Mark. And most scholars believe that this was the uh, was Herod's old palace in Jerusalem, that when the Romans took over Judea as a Roman province in 6 AD and confiscated uh, all of Herod's uh, stuff from his son Archelaus, and they deposed him, that the Roman governors then, whenever they came to Jerusalem, they would have stayed in Herod the Great's old palace. And in 1999, archaeologists who were excavating um, beneath the Kishla, a Roman uh, Ottoman, sorry, an Ottoman era prison near the Tower of David, discovered the foundations of the walls of one segment of Herod's palace. Uh, similarly, if we remember the the account of the Apostle Paul, who was held in prison in Caesarea Maritima, uh, many scholars believe that he would have been held in. Uh, the palace complex of Herod the Great. And you can see the remains of his seaside palace in Caesarea uh, to this day. Yeah, it's interesting when we call him Herod the Great. Obviously, he, he's a great builder, but not a great human being, which we're going to get to a little bit later. But uh, it's interesting now. So of all the projects that he built, though, there's the one that you want to focus on, which is the most obvious to us, and that would be having to do with the expansion of the temple. Now, in the Christmas story, you know, Jesus is presented by his parents at the temple, and they offered their sacrifices, obeying the law of Moses, uh, let's talk about the archaeology of the temple uh, because there's lots of it. Yeah, undoubtedly Herod's greatest building achievement was the expansion that he undertook to the Temple Mount and the renovations to the temple to make it this glorious, glorious structure. Josephus goes to great lengths uh, describing it. And, and I think it was yet another way that he could uh, instill goodwill with the people that he was um, governing and, uh, and keep them uh, appeased. I mean, it was just glorious. Even uh, the Bible records that Jesus' disciples were so impressed with uh, the construction. We read in Mark 13:1, it says, as, as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Well, today you can see the remains of uh, parts of Herod's uh, temple, obviously not the temple itself because it was destroyed so thoroughly by the Romans that not a trace remains on the top of the Temple Mount. But the stonework, the uh, Herodian Ashler stones in the um, in the surrounding uh, retaining wall around the Temple Mount can still be seen there. And in, and you can even go to this day to see some of the the stones and the rubble that the Roman soldiers threw down from the Temple Mount. Uh, onto a road below. When they excavated it, they left some of the stones there in position so people could see uh, what happened. So you can see kind of the remains of that. And then in 2016, archaeologists from the Temple Mount Sifting Project had had discovered a whole bunch of these little um, tile pieces. 
and by comparing um, the tile um, the tiles that were used at other Herodian uh, buildings, they were able to come up with a number of designs that they believe are the designs that people actually would have seen. These are the tiles that people would have walked on um, in the in the temple courts. And so it's it's pretty amazing to see that. And then in 2017, the Temple Mount Sifting Project again uh, came came out and displayed a capital from one of the columns that was from the eastern colonnade of the Semkin Temple period. It was known in the New Testament as Solomon's colonnade. It's described as that in John 10 and Acts chapter 5. And of course, one of the most famous places people go in Jerusalem is to the southern steppes. Um, these are the ancient steps that formed the one of the main access points into the temple. And I believe that these are the steps that Mary and Joseph would have taken. These are um, the steps on the southern part going up. And of course, Bethlehem is to the south of Jerusalem. And so I believe these are the steps that Mary and Joseph would have actually walked when they went to present Jesus to um, in the temple as they were required to by law. Yeah, that's a tour de force there. You know, those uh, geometric uh, patterns that are found in those, those I like to say, the opus sectally uh, squares, right? The, that's a great word. Uh, uh, yep. That's the archaeological term for it. One of our staff members at Shiloh, Frankie Snyder, was involved in sort of resolving how those all fit together. That was a, That's really important. But um, uh, another thing I'd like to, to mention is the, the experience that people have when they actually go walk on those steps that you mentioned, and also see that rubble. I remember the first time I saw that rubble from the destruction of the temple. The, the sadness that I felt uh, experienced, not just the history, right? You want to see it because of the history, but the catastrophe of what had happened because of the rejection of their Messiah. Maybe you could comment on that a little bit, Brian. Yeah, it certainly is a poignant reminder of um, of one of the predictions that Jesus made when his disciples said, oh, look at these glorious stones. Jesus said, you know, the stones from these buildings, there's going to be none left one on top of the other. And, and that's what we see. The retaining wall is still there. But when you go and you see the rubble at the base of the wall that had been hurled off by uh, by the Romans in 70 AD when they destroyed uh, the temple in the city of Jerusalem. It really is a sad reminder of um, of the prophecy that Jesus made and, um, and really um, God's hand in all of that. I mean, it's a sad, sad thing when you see this temple that was the glory of, of Jerusalem, the glory of the Jews. Um, being raised yes. to nothing. Yeah, it is. It is, it is a sad story, and it, it does remind us of the uh, sort of temporal and temporary nature of man's work. And then pointing to Jesus, of course, as the eternal one. Uh, that's where we want to put our ultimate trust in, not in the work of men. As great as the building of that temple was. Okay, uh, let's rewind to the beginning of the life of Jesus. Let's talk about the Magi. Uh, Jesus uh, r- around the time when he was a small b- a baby and uh, their visit and Herod's response to that. Yeah, this is one of the sad parts of the uh, story of the, or the Christmas story. We don't really focus on this at Christmas time, but um, scripture records that when the Magi came, uh, Herod decided that he wanted to go and find this king. And he told the Magi, let me know when you find him. I'd like to worship him. But but he obviously had decided that he was going to uh, try and kill um, all of uh, any rival to his throne. And so when he uh, found out that the Magi had outwitted him and had gone home another way, he set out to kill all of the baby boys two years of age and under in the vicinity of Bethlehem. It's uh, an event known as the slaughter of the innocents. And people often ask, is there any historical evidence outside of the Bible for that particular event? And the, and the short answer is no. There's no evidence of that particular event. However, it is entirely consistent with what we know about Herod the Great at this particular point in history. At the end of his life, he became a, a paranoid tyrant. Josephus records how he um, drowned his brother-in-law Aristobulus because he thought maybe the Romans might might favor him and make him ruler. He uh, murdered his mother-in-law Alexandra. He 
killed his beloved second wife, Mariamne. He ordered his sons, Alexander, Aristobulus, and Antipater to be killed. I mean, Caesar was, uh, is quoted as having said it was better, it would be better to be Herod's pig, his hoose, than his son, his huius, uh, play on words there. And so um, in modern times, people have looked back at this and said, you know, maybe he had some paranoid um, condition, paranoid schizophrenia, or paranoid personality disorder. That Here's the sad reality. The sad reality is that um, this particular event, as tragic as it was, and it was tragic, uh, probably was not um, the type of event that would catch the attention of a historian like Josephus writing a hundred years uh, after this particular event. Uh, Albright has suggested that the population of Bethlehem was only about 300 yes. at the time of Christ's birth. Historian Paul Meyer says, you know, we're probably talking about a a dozen boys maybe in the vicinity who were killed uh, by Herod the Great. And so tragic event, yes, but um, not the kind of event that a historian might take note of, but entirely consistent with what we know about Herod the Great at this particular point in history. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's right. And, this, and, and the argument, there's, there's the fallacy of this argument that you have to, f- you must find external evidence in order to believe what the Bible says about it. Well, the Bible is its own, is its own evidence, not only as a revelation of God, but just as a historical document. So it's really a, a fallacy of reasoning. Okay, we can't stay there though, because we wanna talk some about chronology. Now we can't get into the weeds with this, Brian, but you can give an overview of the relationship between the birth of Christ and Herod's death and just a couple of the views that are out there, because it is important even though we can't get into the weeds. Yeah, and um, anyone who has ever uh, tried to track down and figure out the date of Herod's death and, and thus the birth of Christ uh, knows that it's uh, it's a journey into an abyss <laughs> almost. Um, it's um, it, Here's the thing. We know that Herod the Great was alive when Jesus was born. Uh, we're told in Scripture, in the Gospels, that the um, they... The family left for Egypt to escape Herod's wrath, and then a short time later, we're told, okay, you can go back now because Herod has died, and so they went back and then eventually settled in Nazareth. And 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 here's the thing. Um, we don't really know exactly when Herod died. Anyone who has studied the date of Herod's death knows that it's this convoluted journey into contradictory data in Josephus and in different parts of Josephus. Usually it involves the date when Herod the Great's sons began to rule. It involves uh, Josephus' account of linking his death to a lunar eclipse, uh, possible copying errors that were propagated in later uh, manuscripts of Josephus. It's a bit of a mess, but just briefly, there are two main views. There is the consensus view, which is that Herod died in 4 B. BC, and so Jesus would have been born a year or two before that, so 5 or 6 BC, or that Herod died in 1 BC, in which case Jesus would have been born in 2 or 3 BC. And there are good scholars who land on either side of the issue. Even at ABR, we have good scholars who come to different conclusions yes. on this. And so I'm not, I'm not overly, um, overly dogmatic about it. I myself would lead probably to the 1 BC date, but it's not something that I'm going to, you know, it's not the hill I'm going to die on. Speaking of hills um, and death, though, we do know that Herod the Great, when he died, Josephus tells us he was buried in the Herodium, and Ehud Netzer uh, in 2007 announced that he had finally found, after 35 years, King Herod's uh, mausoleum and um, and a, a red limestone uh, eight-foot-long sarcophagus. And um, there's no inscription on it. Some people have said, could this really be the sarcophagus of Herod the Great? But Netzer uh, says that it is. That's his, his view on that. And so um, we do know Herod was buried there, and there is this, um, this um, tomb that's there. And so that was the end of Herod the Great as we knew him. Yes. And, and, and here's the thing. Herod the Great left a mark on Israel that can still be seen today in his building um, in his architecture. Um, his reign is well documented by historians. And simply put, the Herod of history, particularly at the time of Christ's birth, is the Herod of Scripture. They are one and the same. And so understanding his reign at this period of time and understanding the historical background, uh, particularly for why he might slaughter the boys around Jerusalem, um, helps us to make better sense of what was happening at that particular 
uh, point in history. Ultimately, though, I come back to this. Herod was not the true king of the Jews. King Jesus was the true king of the Jews. And the Magi had it right when they came and said, where is he born king of the Jews? And so at Christmas, that's what I remind myself. um, Christ is king. Amen. King Herod is dead and King Jesus is alive. King Herod is dead. King Jesus is alive. That's good. That's good. Well, excellent. Thanks for taking us on this journey, Brian. Uh, Some of the things I knew about before, some things are new. Yeah. Um, Well, I'll tell you, I'll give you a sneak peek. I'm actually working on a new, uh, every December I do a Christmas blog. um, And this year's Christmas blog is going to be who were the Magi. So um, yeah, I I think that's a great idea. And in fact, I think people want to know, you know, like, I think it's interesting. I think most people would think, wow, you know, uh, where'd they come from and and all that. Uh, Have you ever looked at the alternative, this might be a rabbit trail, so just your quick thought, on the the interpretation of the star, you know, Titus Titus Kennedy was suggesting that the the term aster, and then some is the Greek term for the star, and some early church documents indicate that they thought there was an angel and I never heard that interpretation before. Have you ever heard that before? I've never heard of that one. I, I mean, in terms of the star, I've heard lots of, you know, it's a conjunction, it's this, that, or the other thing. Yeah, yeah. I've seen the star of Bethlehem. I, I tend to, I think, side with um, with uh, Dr. Danny Faulkner, who's an astronomer with Answers in Genesis. Oh, so, oh yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, what does so he say? He, he says, it, you know, from an astronomical point of view, uh, the star planets don't even do that he thinks it's a a supernatural thing that led them um and so that's his particular view it was a supernatural event and so uh we can't find it in uh in the astronomical records so not a not a natural event providentially controlled but a direct supernatural kind of thing it's kind of it's kind of a little bit like the debate about jonah and the whale it was it a whale that God had made before that, or fish that providentially was there, or was it a one that was created just for that purpose? Right. I mean, we don't know. We're probably never going to yeah. know until we get to the other side. But uh, it's interesting. T- Titus was saying it was pointing to some early. That was an early third century document where it was interpreted mm-hmm. as a star, and it is the same word in Greek. It's it's yeah. uh, as an angel, I should say. Hmm. And the reason why I started thinking about it real, just real quick is because, it, I don't know, I think the text says that like it went over the house or, or something like that. Yeah. And when you think about a star doing that, like how do you, how do you see that like visually? How do you know the star's over that house and not like, yes. you, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, and, and you have the fact that it seems that the star disappeared for a period of time. Because when it reappears after they leave, they're overjoyed to see it again. So um, it seems that it 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 just just completely disappeared for a period of time. Yeah. Uh, which of course would make sense why the people of Jerusalem knew nothing about it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, anyway, interesting. I just wanted to hear your take, uh, Danny. Danny's uh, Danny's a good guy. I've met him a couple times, and uh, yeah. So, well, that's interesting to hear that his perspective. All right, on to Bethlehem. Speaking of on star, speaking of Be- speaking of the star, let's uh, let's begin by b- maybe giving an overview of the subject because Bethlehem is uh, not only mentioned in the birth narratives, but it goes back a considerable period of time. Yeah, so Bethlehem is an important uh, town that was located about six miles south of uh, Jerusalem. And it's mentioned about 40 times in the Bible. And so not just, as you mentioned, in connection with the birth narratives of Christ, but back into the Old Testament period as well, Bethlehem was an important town. Sometimes it's paired with or called uh, Ephrath or Ephrathah, Bethlehem Ephrathah. And um, some people have suggested that uh, the name Bethlehem might mean Bethlehem, the house of bread, um, although other suggestions have been made too. We're not exactly sure. It's it's first mentioned in Scripture in connection with um, where Rachel, Jacob's wife, was buried near 
um, what eventually became Bethlehem. But it figures most prominently from the Iron Age on down, the period of the judges on down. And so, for example, uh, the entire, uh, a large part of the book of Ruth is set in Bethlehem, both um, before they leave and, and go to Moab. And when they come back um, into that area, that's where Ruth was from, or Naomi was from, rather. That's where Boaz was from. That's where Naomi and Ruth settled when they came back. Of course, Bethlehem um, is best known for sure as being the birthplace both of King David and King Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, a lot of uh, biblical connections there. Uh, interesting, the name House of Bread, if that's correct, it probably is. Uh, interesting that the bread of life was born there. Uh, it's interesting how God weaves these things into the history of his revelation. Okay, so we talked about a little bit about like how it's in the Bible. So let's talk about the archaeological uh, part of it, give an overview of what we know about Bethlehem. Not Again, not just the time of Jesus, but some of the earlier periods that you mentioned. Well, like a lot of biblical sites, Bethlehem is, is hard to excavate now because a, a modern city is built over top of the ancient town. Uh, but there was um, an archaeological survey done in 1969 by Gutman and uh, Berman, and they um, they did this survey, and they found pottery from different time periods, including uh, the Iron Age, the time of David, the Roman era, the time of Jesus, and even afterwards in the Byzantine period. And um, according to the Anchor Bible Dictionary, the excavations have shown that the Iron Age settlement was not at the top of the spur, as, as many people had originally thought, but down on the slope around what is now known as the church of the nativity. And so basically the surveys and the limited excavations that have taken place there demonstrate that it was occupied at the time that the Bible says it was occupied. Yeah, you did You did mention, here's a, something I want to mention. You know, a lot of times um, people will make arguments, you know, well, we don't have this, that, or that evidence related to the Bible, what we call an argument from silence. And one of the obstacles that we have related to this, is the modern cities built on these ancient sites. Jerusalem is the classic example of a lot of things are said about Jerusalem. But, uh, you know, when you have a modern city built there, it just gives you limitations. But what I hear you saying, Brian, is that what we do know, we do have some evidence of an occupational profile. Is that right, what you say by the pottery? Yeah, and and keep in mind, this was just a surface um, excavation. So they're collecting pottery from the from the surface as they do a survey, but there has been at least one significant excavation there. Uh, we'll talk about a little later in 2015, 2016, which clearly demonstrated it was occupied at the time of Christ. And, um, and so it, it's just, it's just interesting that what we have as limited as it is, does line up with the period that we know that it was occupied according to the biblical text. Yeah. It's a lesson for the church. Uh, if, if people are saying there's not evidence to line up with a biblical account, just be patient and wait and see what happens. And often we find that stuff uh, pops up out of the ground, as it were. And speaking of that, in 2012, uh, that's exactly what happened um, in an excavation in the city of David in Jerusalem. Brian, uh, tell us about that discovery and how it's connected to Bethlehem. Well, this is a pretty exciting discovery because it is the oldest and earliest reference to Bethlehem outside of the Bible. And it's it's on a bula, so a, a clay seal impression that was uh, discovered based on the, uh, the, the, the lettering that is on it. They've dated it to the 7th or 8th century BC. It was found while sifting soil from the excavations in the city of David in the Jerusalem Walls National Park. And this is a tiny thing, like one and a half centimeters, a little over half of an inch, but it bears this ancient Hebrew inscription that says uh, seventh and the name Bethlehem and to the king, Lamelech, to the king. And so basically what they believe this is, is a fiscal bula, a bula, a seal impression from a tax shipment that came in the seventh year of probably King uh, Hezekiah or Manasseh, based on the dating, um, that was sent from Bethlehem to uh, Jerusalem. And so here we have um, we have a, a seal impression from the Iron Age II period that um, shows that it was clearly, obviously occupied at that time, because we've got uh, a group of people sending stuff from Bethlehem uh, to Jerusalem. But really exciting because it's the earliest uh, biblical, uh, earliest reference to Bethlehem outside of the Bible. 
Yeah, and here it is. We find it in Jerusalem. Obviously, nobody's looking for that in particular, not even looking for anything related to Bethlehem. And up, up, up out of the ground pops another discovery, a little teeny tiny thing this small. Okay, we're going we're gonna to shift the discussion to the birth narratives. Maybe you could just set that up for us and just uh, sort of uh, lay the foundation for the next part of our discussion. Yeah, well, people might be surprised to hear, especially if they have uh, sung the Christmas carols for years and read the the nativity accounts in the Gospels, that there is a debate about where Jesus was actually born. Was he born in Bethlehem of Judea, this town south of Jerusalem, or was he born in Nazareth? Or, people might not know this, there was actually another town named Bethlehem right near Nazareth that some people have suggested that was where Jesus was born. Well, I'm glad that we have you here to clear up the mess. <laughs> well, um, yeah, let's talk about Nazareth first. Some people say, um, some uh, critics have said, well, Jesus wasn't born in Bethlehem of Judea, like the Bible says. He must have been born in Nazareth because Jesus was never known in the New Testament, in the Gospels, as Jesus of Bethlehem. He was known as Jesus of Nazareth. And so um, they say he must have been born there. Well, we know that his parents were from Nazareth, according to Luke 1. Um, we know that he grew up in Nazareth, according to Matthew 2. Uh, but it doesn't mean that he was necessarily born there. It's just that he considered that his hometown, where he grew up. So I'll use myself as an example. Um, if people asked me where I grew up, I would tell them that I grew up in Hilton Beach, a little town here in northern Ontario in Canada. That's where I spent my formative years. Uh, from about the 18 months old until I was in grade nine. I would say I grew up in Hilton Beach, but that's not where I was born. I was born in a city in Southern Ontario named Oshawa, but I would say I was from Hilton Beach. I think in the same way, Jesus was known as Jesus of Nazareth. It doesn't mean that he was born there, just that that's where he grew up. That's the place he was associated with. And then there's this other Bethlehem, and the argument goes like this. There was a Bethlehem that is quite close to um, Nazareth. It's Bethlehem of Galilee instead of Bethlehem of Judea. And the argument uh, is based on two particular pieces of evidence. First of all, um, the people who support this say, well, um, there is not a lot of evidence for uh, first century occupation in Bethlehem of Judea, but there is at Bethlehem of Galilee. Second of all, people have a hard time imagining a pregnant woman making a journey of a hundred, 150 kilometers uh, from Nazareth down to uh, Bethlehem and Judea, whereas this little, you know, five miles west, that's, that's a lot easier to imagine. But um, we have to be careful that we're not bringing our modern preconceptions to the ancient world. Today, particularly for people who live in cities, they can't imagine a journey of that walking. Um, but we know that people in the ancient world frequently traveled great distances walking. Uh, in fact, um, the Jewish people from Nazareth would have made trips three times a year during the, during the great feast to Jerusalem. And I dare say more than one pregnant lady made the trip uh, probably during that time. And so I don't think that it's a stretch to think that um, Mary uh, made the trip. Uh, here's the big thing, though, for me. The Bible's really clear. <laughs> Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Both Matthew and Luke are clear on this particular point. It was fulfilling the Old Testament prophecy in Micah 5.2 that a ruler for Israel would come from Bethlehem Ephrathah. That was in the territory of Judah, Bethlehem of Judea in the New Testament times. And remember, when the Magi came, Herod came, called his uh, his experts and in the law and said, where, where is the Messiah? Where is the Christ to be born? And they said, in Bethlehem of Judea. And so... Um, I think that it is, uh, it's pretty clear, really, uh, from my perspective, I think it's a bit a, a much ado about nothing. The reality is that the Nazareth theory and the Bethlehem of Galilee theory have not gained much traction at all in the academic world for good reason, because the, the ancient texts that are most closely related and most accurate about the life of Christ, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, are clear. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Yeah, it makes total sense. You got to stop using this flamethrower of common sense when you analyze these things, Brian. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, the other part is too, the biblical authors uh, were familiar with the geography and the Judea part of it is probably added to, you know, get rid of any confusion about which Bethlehem it was in addition to the prophetic dimension of it. Okay, so now we want to talk about the archaeological part because you mentioned earlier 
2016, there were some archaeological excavations done. Uh, who did it and what they find? Yes. Yeah, so in 2015, 2016, there were excavations just outside the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. They were led by Shimon Gibson and uh, Joan Taylor, and um, they uh, went down to first century AD levels, and they uh, found clearly first century pottery uh, from a village at that time. And uh, in an on-site interview conducted by Joel Kramer, Gibson noted that they had found pottery dating to the first century, and he's quoted as saying, what we've been able to prove up till now is the existence of a village from the time of Jesus. This is very important. You can see um, this entire um, episode on Joel Kramer's YouTube channel, Expedition Bible. You just search for unearthing the prophecy of Jesus' birthplace. Here's, here's the bottom line. The bottom line is we now have archaeological evidence from a first century village right near the Church of the Nativity um, that, has been, that has been excavated. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, we want to recommend people watch that. Uh, Joel is a friend of the ABR ministry, an archaeologist, filmmaker. He's been on our show several times and uh, has a great book, uh, Where God Came Down, the archaeological evidence that fits in with that. Okay, so maybe um, a, a little bit here, Brian. Again, we have, uh, and I, hate, I almost hate to beat the drum on this, but it's important for maybe somebody tuning in for the first time, you know, uh, if you read the literature 20, 30 years ago, they would say, we don't have any evidence from Bethlehem about first century occupation, therefore the Bible's inaccurate. And now here we go, six, seven years ago, now Shimon Gibson and Taylor, they dig there, bang, what do they find? And these are not Christians either, as far as I know. Um, comment again on this argument from silence and how, as the church, we've got to be vigilant about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important that we remember, I think it was Kenneth Kitchen's maxim, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. But there have just been too many times in history, uh, particularly as we've studied biblical history, where people have said, ah, we have no evidence for that, so clearly the Bible is wrong. And you just have to wait because uh, we'll eventually get, hopefully, to excavating particular areas. The reality is that, that a very small percentage of the lands of the Bible have been excavated. And of the sites that are excavated, only a very small percentage of those particular sites are excavated. And at Bethlehem, we've got a modern city built over the ancient town. And so um, they were only really able to sink a couple of shafts down, but that was enough right beside the Church of the Nativity to demonstrate that it was clearly occupied. There was a village there in the first century. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Bryant Wood, our director of research, you know, he, he would always use this analogy of a widget factory when you did quality control. Every, every 20 widgets, you'd pull one off the assembly line and examine it. Uh, and pull another 20th one, you examine it, you know, just make sure that it's made the proper way, right? Well, it seems like a, maybe a silly analogy, but that's exactly what archaeology is. You're only getting 5% of what we know. And in this case, in Bethlehem, even less because of the modern city. I've always remembered that widget factory thing. The first time I ever heard Bryant talk somewhere, I went to a talk where he used that thing. And I can't, it's been over 20 years and I, and I always remember it, but... Uh, I, I love Joel. Joel at the beginning of his book, um, where God came down, he, he uses the analogy of a puzzle, and that um, you know. Uh, so I've used that analogy too, where I go, you know, you got a hundred piece puzzle. Most people think we have all but five pieces. In reality, we only have five pieces, and we kind of take the picture of it from from the Bible, but we don't really have a lot of the of the pieces. We don't have many of the pieces of these sites. We just have a, a small percentage, 5% often. Yep. Yeah, and the, and the man fills in the blanks, unfortunately. All right, Brian, uh, let's talk about the Church of the Nativity. Uh, this is fascinating. You know, it's uh, it's got a long heritage, but I'm not going to say anything more. I'm going to let you tell the audience about it. Yeah, I mean, if you talk about Bethlehem, you have to talk about the Church of the Nativity. It is the arguably the most famous structure in uh, Bethlehem uh, today. It is a church that was originally constructed during Constantine's reign over, it is said, a cave where Jesus was born. And over the centuries, it was expanded and excavations inside the church have actually confirmed the historical records that there was uh, beneath the this church from Constantine's time, there was an earlier octagonal uh, basilica. Um, sorry, that dated to the time of Constantine, which is underneath the current structure. And so um, 
should maybe comment on this idea that Christ was born in a cave. Um, it's an ancient tradition. In 150 AD, Justin Martyr wrote that Christ was born in a cave near Bethlehem. That's in the second century. In the third century, Origen, in about 248 AD, wrote that um, there is shown in Bethlehem a cave where Jesus was born in the manger in the cave where he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. And then, and then in the in the fourth century, Jerome, um, famous uh, church father, moved to Bethlehem and is said to have lived in a cave right next to uh, this particular uh, cave of Christ's birth. And um, in his book, um, Where God Came Down, the archaeological evidence, Joel Kramer notes that there has indeed been found evidence of ancient caves beneath the Church of the Nativity. Um, they were excavated in 1949-1950 by Baghetti, and he found evidence that they were indeed uh, used during the in use during the first century AD. Now, here's the thing. The Bible does not say anything about a cave, but it doesn't say anything about a stable either. What it does talk about is a manger, that Jesus was laid in a manger. And people have assumed an unmentioned stable because there is a manger, but the Bible actually doesn't uh, say that. And we know from archaeological excavations that many um, stone mangers, plaster-lined mangers, have been found within um, the main floor of first century dwellings and even older dwellings. It seems that um, people in ancient times would keep young or vulnerable or special animal, animals safe in their home at night. And uh, people would say, well, hang on, Brian, there's, there's an inn mentioned there in uh, Luke 2. And Yes, that word's been translated in, but that's not a very good translation. And modern translations are starting to change. The new NIV, for example, now translates it upper room because it's the same word that is used um, in Luke 22, where Jesus and his disciples celebrate um, the, the Last Supper in the upper room. Um, Luke knows the word for um, for an inn, like a hotel, a public lodging place, because he uses it in Luke 10 for the story of the Good Samaritan. There's even an innkeeper there. We don't have that in this particular place. And so if you look at the archaeology and the textual evidence, the picture that emerges is that there was, there may have been a cave that was attached to a first century dwelling that there was a manger in, and uh, oftentimes uh, first century dwellings were a couple of stories. There was an upper room and, and then a manger room in the dwelling. And so the idea that we have at Christmas of Jesus arrived, Jesus, uh, Mary and Joseph arriving late one night and getting stuck in the barn out back because the Motel 6 had no vacancy <laughs> is really a, a, a modern Western understanding. That's not what the textual and archaeological evidence would suggest. It would suggest that Mary and Joseph arrived, someone was already occupying the, the upper room uh, of their family's house, this family's house, the relative's house that they stayed in, and so they got the manger room, which may have been uh, in a cave there. So yeah, that, that's great, Brian. So now for folks hearing this that are a little unfamiliar, we have an episode of Digging for Truth called uh, The Christmas Story, How Well Do You Know It?, where Gary Byers, one of our staff members, kind of walks through more of the details that Brian's, talk, Brian's talking about, particularly the upper room, the translation of the Greek cataluma. It is not in. And so um, uh, we, uh, we don't want to be party poopers about the Christmas story, but we do want to get at the truth of the matter. It's, it's very important uh, as it relates to that. So what you're suggesting, Brian, is a first century home uh, closely associated with this cave, perhaps interconnected in some kind of way. Uh, the tradition goes back really far. I mean, we're talking about Justin Martyr, Origen, and Jerome, so there's a continuity of tradition as well. That's important. So, good, that's great. Well, uh, it, it's really been uh, really an excellent tour of Bethlehem. Uh, we've learned more about it. This archaeology that you mentioned, you know, is fascinating from the excavation in 2015-16. So I'll let you um, sort of uh, give a summary of everything we've talked about. Yeah, so when we look at Bethlehem and the, the town of Bethlehem, particularly as it relates to the birth of Jesus, what we see is that the ancient texts, beginning with the New Testaments, 
And, um, and then the ancient texts, even in the second and third century, which refer to a cave where Jesus was born in Bethlehem, they all align with what we know from first century cultural practices of homes and, and manger rooms um, in the floor of a first century home. It certainly aligns with the historical information. It aligns with the archaeological information right at the Church of the Nativity, which they have demonstrated through excavations, have these caves underneath it. Um, right beside the Church of the Nativity, we have these excavations which have shown that it was um, occupied in the first century, just like uh, the Bible says. In fact, archaeologist John McRae summarizes, he says, the tradition of Jesus, that Jesus' birth took place in Bethlehem of Judea is long and solid. There appears little reason to doubt its essential trustworthiness. Um, Albright estimated that, uh, I think we mentioned that a population of about 300 uh, in Bethlehem when Jesus was born, and, and this kind of important town but kind of an out-of-the-way town, smaller town, is an appropriate way when one thinks about the humble way our Savior entered uh, this earth, born um, of a virgin, born to what we know was a relatively poor family. And so uh, at the same time, he's, he's also born in a very important place. He's born in the city of David. Yes. And that's important because Scripture in the New Testament makes a big deal of the fact that Jesus is the one who fulfills the prophecy that God made to King David that he would have someone sitting on his throne reigning forever. And we believe that that is King Jesus, that we are servants of the King. And that's what I remember. And I'm going to celebrate this Christmas. Amen, Brian. Thank you again for your excellent work and for being on the show today. Thanks, Henry. There's a lot of interesting things about the Christmas story and context clues that's found in the Bible. And Henry and Brian only talked about a few of them today. We'll put some links to some of the other things that they mentioned in the show notes if you want to see some more Christmas stuff. And you can find more articles researched and written by Brian Wendell at BibleArchaeologyReport.com. Until next time. Digging for Truth is a presentation of the Associates for Biblical Research. To find out more about ABR, just go to BibleArchaeology.org.